so what, uh, what I've done here is, uh, and I hate to interrupt the conversations because that's like 90% of why, what we want to inspire you to do, right, is, is connect with each other, build and collaborate, but uh, uh, so I know it's counterintuitive, but I, I would like you guys to keep those conversations going. And uh, um, we're trying to do a lot in a short amount of time, right? So uh, I thank you guys for using the, uh, the question bucket, we'll call it, you know, uh, the question bucket. And uh, uh, the reason I do this, or we, you know, this is a common practice, I guess, that many conferences you go to, right, is uh, if somebody puts a question in there, there's a really good chance other people have the same question. And a lot of times when, I, when, when you do this, you look through the bucket and you find seven of the same question uh, on a card uh, at times too. So what I've done is just try to aggregate uh, some of the, the major themes that are in there. Uh, we may not be able to answer every single question that was put in there, but it also will answer the vast majority of them. Uh, and some things are actually that you guys asked about, uh, we will, uh, we're going over tomorrow. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be able to get to that. So, um, you know, so for example, I think somebody put in, two people put in uh, questions about recruiting, right? How to be noticed by college coaches and what the recruiting process is like. This is a question we get almost everywhere. So that's exactly what I'm talking about tomorrow morning. And uh, Coach Lace will help me out with that as well. And we'll, 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 we'll talk to you guys about that tomorrow morning. So don't be offended we didn't answer that question. We're gonna do that tomorrow and we'll have plenty of time uh, to go over it. Some of the questions like Tim was asking about, you know, effective drill, um, patience, or how to, you know, create a, a, a training session that, May look a little ugly, but you know how, what's the what's the fine line in the art of it? Drew's going over that tomorrow, and we'll we'll get we can get more into some of those other questions about drills. We'll have some time to really dive into what drills and uh, kind of what we call like practicing ugly looks like, right? Training ugly and how, how you uh, go in that. That comes out of the uh, uh, getting sandy like a professional. If you guys have read some of the uh, 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 Navy SEALs literature, right? Navy SEALs always say that I get sandy like a professional because they talk about diving in the sand. And some of you nodding your head, so. If you read the Navy SEAL stuff, you know what I'm talking about. We'll get into it tomorrow. Um, so in any case, what I'll do is I'll again, aggregate these questions. Some of those, like I said, we'll get to it um, when we have all day tomorrow. Uh, and uh, and I'll, for some of them, I'll ask a specific coach to answer it. And some I'll say, hey, everybody take a quick stab at it. You know, and go two minutes each or something here, all right? But um, so one question that came in from uh, from somebody was for Dan uh, about on-ball on -ball pressing. So uh, Drew talked a little bit about how to press the ball and the advantage of running a press. So maybe briefly talk a little bit more about uh, how you teach your players specifically to push to be pressing on the ball. Uh, first, you need to know for that is it's not easy drill. Second, you need to. Uh, uh, Repetition, repetition, and repetition. So you got two things, you know, uh, which are, for me, it's very important. First, first way or two ways how you're supposed to try to make it drill. One is to go a little bit, uh, anticipate and cut the passing line with the heads in front of the attacker. This is one thing. And second thing is to block the passing line with the legs in front. The same thing. This is the same thing in two different ways so always you're trying uh, for those all those those two drills you're trying to don't go to don't get in the physical contact it's harder but gonna get uh, them in that drill so you're trying to go a little bit ahead in the front of the attacker a little bit higher a little bit cheat but you can if you're going higher you know what you should expect. So the driving is coming and you should be aware that backdoor driving is supposed to come as a one way for them to open them to see, receive the ball. And the second thing is, as I said, to put legs in front and then you're trying to provocate them that they are going to think that the passing line is open but indeed the passing line is controlled by yourself. By you. Uh, what? The player has the ball in their hand. Right? The player has the ball in their hand. So. Okay. Okay. I think this. What I said is harder. Yeah. What is when the ball in the hand is totally you know uh, you got 
do two different ways also. You can go with the left arm, or you can go with the right arm, right arm, right, right arm. If you're going with the left arm on him, you got this block on the right hand or, this, or right shoulder, opposite shoulder, all this time to protect yourself if he is going reverse spin back inside. Or if you're going with the right hand, as I said, with the same thing is with, when you're a little bit cheating with the heads with the elbow, you're going with the right hand, a little bit attacking them, but you're ready to go inside spin to protect yourself, to be ready to block that drive behind your back door. So, uh, everybody heard about this spider drill. So, spider drill is very useful for pressing. So, also, the mentally approach regarding pressing, I like to see pressing without holding. I like to see pressing exactly what I said, without holding, you know. Right, right now, these days are not so easy to play pressing without uh, holding because the game is going in the direction. But the beauty of the game is to try to play the pressing, you know, without holding. Why? Because I think, to, I like to see after that you're opening the, uh, the counter-attack line, so you can go easy in counter-attack after that. So, if you're holding and you're playing pressing, and right now in these days, foul and make the foul in pressing is not enough. So, in these days, in the, in the upcoming years of the water polo, you must try to redirect the ball on, uh, try to force the attackers to pass the ball in the, in the side where you was want the ball. If they're going, even if they're, for example, the center is open on the left side, and if you allow the foul on that side, if you not immediately start to return back and help the center defender and make the double play, you're already done. So it's not enough right now in these days just to make the foul. And because of that, I'm telling everyone, try to make the pressing without physical contact. This is one thing about tactical, technical things, but I think it's very important also to share with you guys. Uh, my quote is usually, uh, if we are in defense, that doesn't mean that we are not capable to attack the offense. So it's very pro uh, important to change uh, mentality or the mindset that you are what I like those pictures, what I saw, you know, what uh, Drew showed you guys, when, how you're supposed to feel and how you're supposed to face, supposed to look like when you're starting the defense. So, and, you know, and he showed that you, you cannot be confused, you cannot be afraid, you cannot be lost. But I will add also, you must be ready to attack. Attack, attacking in the defense, attacking in your, when you're in defense, attackers, there's a high level of water for any kind of sport. So after that, you can go in fast break and fast transition, whatever, but mentally, if you're ready and you're not giving up from the, from the beginning, just to defend yourself, if you just be ready to defend yourself, that's going to be hard, hard task. Dan, do you, would you mind if I demonstrated the position that you just described with Drew here? Okay. So, okay, we talked about two different presses. One was here, and I'm, the ball is here, yep. and I'm going for the ball here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Now, the other one he described was legs in the passing lane, which I think he means like legs this. Yeah. I'm facing the ball, so the attacking player thinks or the passer thinks the lane is open, but really, when he throws it, I'm able to jump. Kind of different, right? Vulnerable to a drive. Okay, he talked about on-ball pressing with the left or right hand. So with the left hand, yes. you're, you're talking like this, going down, going, okay. bring this guy to here, and you're going on elbow, and you're going on the ball. If you're going in the opposite, if you try to uh, let's say steal the ball when you are there, you explode and going on him, and he's going in reverse. When you feel when you're missing him, you already return back, you go on this side. Then you're not following him, you are following imagine point behind him because here is not your point of interest anymore. The controlling of space is your controlling of interest. So if you're going this, you must be ready to recover is coming all the way down, all the way here. You're not 
key is not your point in this. After you make that spin, 180 spin, then you can go again on him like a normal blocking or normal shot blocking. So am I? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, Thank you. And Coach also mentioned a drill called Spider Drill, right? And the Spider Drill is on our, uh, it's on the coaching app, right? It's one of the, the, the main drills that you see there. You'll see the video. Uh, but it's essentially in two quick points on that when you look at it is when we, the reason we call it a spider is you're completely on your stomach, right? With uh, your hips up, arms are wide, and we're using all four limbs, right? You'll hear Coach Adosich a lot, and a lot of the great coaches use this a lot where they say using all four limbs, right? So my hands are working, right? My legs are working, and I'm working on the surface of the water in this horizontal position. Uh, and you can vary the drill or vary that body positioning in laps by having them move in certain 360 circles or you know working in 180 as they go through the laps so they can vary being in that in that kind of spider ready press position. You know? What's that? It's like a tabletop. A little bit, yeah. How's it Tabletop. He's saying sometimes they call it tabletop because you're a little bit like a tabletop short. I mean you're in the horizontal position, hips are up, legs are wide. I mean, this is actually a great, I'm glad you brought that up. I want to kind of repeat that. Uh, repeat <clears throat> something that um, across my mind is Drew and everybody was talking today. You know, we, I said this in the very, very beginning of introducing this thing. We're trying not to create robot coaches, right? So maybe there are some things some of these coaches said that maybe I have a different philosophy, right, than they do. Or you have a different philosophy or another coach could come in next week and say, I take exclusions at two meters, Coach Kluke, you know, at the high school level, and this is why, and I'm going to give you 10 statistics why. That doesn't mean that person's right and this person's wrong or, or nothing. We're here to create our own philosophies and if you need to change your terminology for your own team to make them understand, then that works as well. And so I think that every coach has said this authenticity and developing our own coaching philosophies and our own coaching practices is, is a crucial point. So I'm glad, I'm glad you said that, it reminded me of that point. Um, okay, another, uh, another question. Several, several people asked this question. I think this is a good one. Uh, for everybody to take two minutes on, and, and I'll end. We'll start with Drew and kind of pass the mic. Take less than two minutes, two minutes or less to talk about this. Um, how do you use video analysis in uh, your practice and your training? How does the video work? Um, and maybe some tactics. Drew could talk about how uh, we talked about something over here, how to make it affordable for everybody, all those things. Just two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Siri, set a timer. If you can. Um, Two and a half for you. So, uh, so I, I coach with a gentleman um, who's very articulate and, and very thorough. And so our form of film is, is typically we just press play on the computer and he just space bars it and just drops knowledge and there's, you know, right in the notebooks. And, and that's good actually because you get, you get the, one of the problems I have with cutting film and then watching like all your six on five plays or all your or your six on five possessions or whatever is there's just so much value in um, the, the fluidity of the game and the tempo of the game and the emotion of the game and that you just have to watch the game to pick up on. And, and so don't, I mean, you can go sports code or all these you can go really expensive or really cheap and cut film and cut out possessions. And that's really important to look at your body positioning and things like that, but, but also don't, don't get away from having your kids watch a quarter or watch a half or something like that. How we use video other than watching the whole game, I said that tongue in cheek a little bit, uh, but we do use a, a program where we cut film uh, and we, we block out all the phases of the game, whatever we want to block out, um, and then we'll watch you know, maybe 10 minutes of film in, in, in before practice. Typically, in season, we're watching Film maybe 50% of the week is a at the start of practice anywhere from 10 minutes to 35, 40 minutes, just depending on what's going on that week. Um, and kids have notebooks, and we and we we quiz them on things. We uh, try to be as academic in the classroom with the film stuff as possible. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's typically that. I mean, I think other people that I've worked with where. Uh, they'll cut film, they'll put it in folders, whether you use Google Doc or whatever, and, and they'll, they'll share, like a kid, a student, an athlete has an individual folder shared with them on Google Doc, and you can share it with them. So they'll clip out you know, some center positions, uh, possessions or some power play stuff or whatever, and they'll share them with the guys, and you can create notes in it or things like that. There's also fancy programs that cost a lot of money that can do virtually the same thing. Um, 
you know, I, on the plane over, John and I were working on some stuff and we were using QuickTime to just clip out video clips. And so it's just being creative, Google, Googling, how do you do this and that? And, and so you can do it for very little, little money to, to no money or to, you know, buy a lot of programs that, you know, all the best colleges use. And, and, um, and so it just depends on what you have for your budget and, and whatnot. But we typically at Jay Sarah will, will watch video, like I said, 10 to 35, 40 minutes before a practice. And then um, ideally that kind of sets up and drives our practice. So we want to, if we're working on like counterattack that day, we're, we're for sure watching some clips of us in the counterattack and isolating some things that we're wanting to be aware of and address. Um, but for our practice video, we use QuickTime and I, um, I just watch it and I take handwritten notes and then go through it uh, note by note the next day with them. For our game footage and scouting, we use uh, Sport Code and we use some, some software that uh, allows the guys to watch the film on their phones, which is, I found, the most effective way. There's just not enough time to watch all the film that you have. We watch 25 minutes of film before every practice, keep it to 25 minutes. I've been through some three-hour video sessions that, you know, no. So 25 minutes, and then we go to practice. Uh, and we compile pretty substantial scouting reports on our opponents based on the different facets of the game that we uh, reference for upcoming games. It will take more than two minutes, <laughs> just let you know. Uh, why? Because I think uh, it's important to share with you guys everything. Uh, I think I need to give the credits to John and uh, my staff and everyone who is working with USO Water Polo. Uh, I'm delighted that I can say probably clear and loud that we are advanced comparing our opponents in the world in this video technique and video and analyzing uh, the opponents and ourselves. So we are using sport code. Uh, we are capable to cut the games by the clips in real time. We can send we can send information even if it's not allowed to the bench during the game. It's not allowed, we are not doing this, but I'm just <laughs> giving the impression to just to understand how the system is advanced you know and uh, we can we are cutting the clips I, I knew that it would be really interesting for you guys so uh, we can, we are cutting the, by the phase of the uh, of, uh, by the game uh, phases of the games usually everybody doing the same thing but Contra-attack, uh, front court coffee, front court distance, you know, uh, this one, six on five, five men, but I just want to highlight one thing. During, the, when we are watching the games, I create, and this is what we are doing, we are calling this learning folder. So in that group, and that, you know, folder, we are adding everything, what I'm taking in that moment is very important for us, to think in upcoming days how we're going to implement this, this uh, what we saw in upcoming practice, how they're going to benefit and how we're going to learn from this. So doesn't mean we are not putting in that folder just us from that game. We are putting also the opponents and we are calling this learning folder. And thanks for uh, John, specific, specifically him, during the competition, we are capable, before they're going to the bed, when we return back to the hotel after the game, we can cut by the positions, everything, and we are sending all the clips we are huddled to the players and can, they can go in the bed and watch tomorrow I can prepare using their iPads and their computers. And the same thing we are doing for the goalies. So the goalies got, it's not a secret, everybody's doing this, but we can, we got sheet and, and uh, all the shams where each of the players are shooting for upcoming games. And I don't know if how many guys you watch uh, European Championship in Budapest last, uh, I don't know, two weeks ago. So did, how many of you guys watch uh, 
it not, was not an important game, but it was game uh, Serbia against Italy for uh, fifth position. So please pay attention about last possession of Italians end of the second quarter. What Di Fulvio did in that motion. So this is the beauty of water polo, I can call this. So, and this is the clip exactly what we have in our drills. But one is that you can, and you're doing the drill on the practice, one is to repeat the drill and have the benefit from the drill on the high level of the game. And just to don't forget, when I watched what Danny was presenting, and someone asked how, many, how, many, how often they are using video, and when they start to use this, I had my uh, experience now uh, when I was coaching Serbs and we were pre preparing for, I, I don't remember, it's 11 or 12, and we were uh, one week in Barcelona to have common practice with the Spanish national team. And we were sharing the pool, they put us, and we used the pool in their uh, Olympic facility, let's say half away, half an hour from Barcelona, and we were sharing the pools, there were pools next to each other, outdoor, with uh, Spanish synchronized swimmers, sw swimming team. It was really, because we had the break and I didn't want to go, so I sit under the shade and under the tree and I watch what they're doing. So the synchronized swimming was spent there, one of the number one comparing Russian swimmers, synchronized swimmer in the world. So they had portable TV and uh, video equipment on the practice from 8 o'clock in the morning until 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So they did the drill, they did the error, you know, what they're doing. The coach called them, gave them instructions, both of, everyone watched for three minutes what they did, and they are going in repetition and repetition all day long. Mm. So you can do whatever you want. Right now, this technique is pretty much, you know, accessible, acceptable for everyone. You can buy it. It's only how you want to, you know, build your practice, how you want to organize your practice, you know. And I, I ask myself, what you asked, why we cannot do this, you know. So we, we are going in that direction. And we did, especially when we were in UCI a long time ago, you know, right now, you know, we're going to find a way to find this portable TV that we can walk, you know. And this is the best way, you know. One thing is what you, when you tell the, the kids, you know, do this, do this. Another thing is when they see them. You know, when you address them, as you say, hey, you did this good or you did this wrong. He said, yes, I did this good. I agree with you, but I don't agree, disagree with what I did wrong. And he, he got the wrong picture. You know, when he sees himself, immediately he sees him, he's capable to change. Sorry. Yeah, and say, so I, I carry my iPhone with me, right? And just video, video someone doing a skill and then pull them over and show them the video and go do it again. And that's a very quick way to do, you know, what Dan's talking about, and and uh, so just be creative like that. Just and then like Dan, Dan talked about, talk to their coaches too, you know. Um, what what's basketball doing? What's soccer doing? Things like that. Uh, <clears throat> that's all really uh, valuable stuff. Just so you know, uh, Coach Adosic is a huge Patriots fan, so that's why he gets his, his video <laughs> techniques. So we talk about it. Uh, <laughs> You'll, you'll see him in his Patriots beanie after this. That's where they make that up. Uh, I, this is true. This is true. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking specifically about video. Uh, I'll, I'll piggyback on what Drew said. So we mentioned kind of three different products. You heard three different products in there at any given time, and I want to kind of quantify this for you, right? Because you're sitting there uh, maybe thinking, I'm a high school coach. I don't have a budget. I don't have time to do film. What do I do? So QuickTime is free on MacBooks. So everything that we did to cut up, this is a free service, right? So you could literally a video from your phone or from your iPad on QuickTime. I have no coaches to use iMovie, also free, right? And you could do chop up video quickly on iMovie. What Drew Clute just said, uh, I, do, I do this sometimes when I run a clinic and I don't know the kid. Uh, I'll say, hey, I'm watching you do center, you know, some center moves, right? And I'll video on the phone and then I'll get him out of the pool and say, type your phone number into the text and text, I'll text you the video. 
right? So that's an easy way to do it. There are other things called, like, you may know Coach's Eye, right, or these other type of uh, free apps that have certain levels you can do for free. But again, iPhones let you do that for, for free. QuickTime is free. Now, Huddle. Huddle you may have heard of, right? This is a video sharing software that works. The basic level package for Huddle is approximately $300 a year. It's not that bad, right? So 300 bucks you can find fundraise. That's, a, that's half a car wash from when I was a high school coach too, right? All right, you do a car wash, 300 bucks, you got Huddle for the year. And that gives you it to do enough to share the video with your team and email it quickly. 300 bucks. Sports code is now owned by Huddle. Right? So what Huddle can do in terms of clipping video, they've taken some of the sports code stuff and made it available on the basic packages of Huddle. For 600 bucks a year for Huddle, you can get more. I think it's well worth the investment. We're not suggesting that at uh, you, you know, University of California or the national team where we can spend $10,000 on that. That's not what we're suggesting. Right? So sometimes you'll hear that, but this is not cost prohibitive. 300 bucks or even better, free, right? Just using your iPads, uh, you can get started on that right away. And, and can't, can't recommend it enough. Now in terms of time, right? Like when Coach Lyson says, I've videotaped my whole practice, he's not watching the whole practice with the team again the next day, right? When we say clip, we're showing them highlights, clips. So maybe Coach has 25 minutes before practice, like you said, maybe you only have 10. That 10 minutes is still super valuable. Five minutes of video could be super valuable. I mean, that just don't limit yourself mentally of where this can go. Well, A couple of people asked the same question when we were talking about positive possessions. So maybe we'll go to a little bit to stat keeping since we're talking about video. So someone asked a question, two people asked a question, how do you track positive possessions, right? How do you track positive possessions? Maybe everybody can talk a little bit about how you're using your, what are one thing other than just goals and assists, what's a way you're tracking statistics with, uh, with positive possessions? Go speed around again, this time for real. I know when the other team's having positive possessions where I'm stressed out on every defensive possession. That's how I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard to use, you can use data a little bit, but you also have to just define what you, what you consider as a positive possession. I think a lot of that's emotion too. I mean, if you feel as a coach you're controlling the possession and your defense is, you know, you also know that you don't have to get scored on to feel like Dan's yeah, kind of alluding to really sketched out and really nervous and really anxious. Um, to me, I, I would say, you know, the longer you can stay in a press, uh, that's a good thing. The less that you allow the ball to swing side to side, so it's pushed down to the right side and quickly swings to the left side, that's a good thing. Uh, if the ball is going to move from one side to the other, it's got to go position by position, so it allows more time to go off, but also your defender to adjust. Um, you know, if, if you're not allowing live entries, into, I mean, if, if you know, you, the, the John's the center and the ball keeps getting live entry into him and we're getting lucky with some awareness and some crashes, okay, but at some point someone's not gonna be aware and you know, the ball is gonna get, a, there's gonna be a good shot got off or whatever. Um, so just figuring out what you, what you define as a positive possession and, and based on your team and your strengths. I think. For me, it will be a short one. So for me, is uh, everything what you're doing in offense to control your moment or momentum when you're losing the ball, that you can, after that, organize yourself well in defense is positive possession. So I will not get deeper to analyze all those aspects of the game. But if you watch the games and more than 50% of uh, uh, situations when or which hurt your teams is starting from momentum when and how you're losing the ball. Is the turnover on the end of rushing the shot or wrong shot or forcing something what is totally unlogical to do in that moment or trying to do something what is totally not logical in that moment. So, I don't like to dump the ball, but at the end of the day, I prefer to dump the ball on the side and control my defense and transition defense after that to don't go in something what will create immediately advantage for my opponents. 
what an easy way to, to say that is that a, a positive offensive possession is one where you're not getting countered out the other way. You're not giving up an advantage on the uh, at the end of it. That's why one thing also, another thing for me is also to not allow this open pass from the side, what we saw on the, on the clip from uh, Danny. If you allow the open pass from one side which uh, center is facing, this is the same almost thing like uh, you must stop them and put them in the vertical <laughs> for one second at least to allow center defender to organize himself. This is very important because right now, you know, in these days, fast transition and 6-on-6 six on, six on both sides is also advantage, if we agree about that. So... You have something to say? No, I uh, I would say another, and that's, that's really good, right? Because we talk a lot about, when I watch a lot of high school water polo around the country, not just in the Midwest, Southeast, Northeast, how fast teams play on offense, and some of you guys have been here for a while, like Martin, Tim, or whomever, right? Like, heard me say this at different things. When we play really fast, when teams play really fast on offense, what you're giving up is the counter the other way, right? So when we're not playing control, we see this a lot at the high school level, just to, just to talk about it. Um, the other thing I would say, another thing I would track it on a positive possession, uh, and this is because I was a center and I have to coach centers a lot, right, when I played, is sometimes with the national teams and, and with college teams, we'd say a positive possession, now that I'm talking about an individual player, is a positive possession for my center was every time he was able to, or he or she was able to get to the two meter line, center cage, and get the defender on their back. And then I would put a, a plus on the stat sheet, right? Or my center got to the two meter line, their center cage, they forced the other team, they got the defender on their back, they forced the other team to get in the zone, positive, right? There it is. So you can have positive possession type tracking for individual players as well, right? I mean, you've got to be something to think about. You can give it them. Then my center at the end of the, the game, because centers and defenders, they're the, sometimes the statless wonders, right? Like you can, a defender can play a beautiful, wonderful game and their stat line is three exclusions against them, right? And, you, and, and then that kid, right, goes home and is like, I don't get enough credit, I'm not in the stat sheet, right? Now I've created, hey, I, as a defender, I create a, a stat line of what I think a positive possession for you as a defender, and look at the end of the game, this is what you did. It's positive reinforcement for them, so they know, because we all know, and you all know now as, as coaches, that's, those stats don't matter for that kid. You know? So it's a very good question. Uh, someone else asked, uh, when we're talking about, uh, now since we're talking about offense, uh, at the high school level, right? Most, most everyone here is coaching at the high school. How many people coach high school water polo here? There you go, that's what I thought. That's why I keep referring back to high school, right? And this, I know many of us are here at this level. Um, so I can make it as relevant as possible. At the high school level, we talked about trying to teach offense and front court offense. How do we make this, uh, how many layers, how many plays? I talked about not having a lot of plays, right? So let's try to quantify, right? If you're coaching a high school team in the 12 week season, how do we teach offense? How complicated should I make this uh, in my short season? A loaded question. I mean, I, I think you're balancing the Spider-Man thing again. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do uh, that'll get you get you buckets now that don't really de de develop the whole player. Um, and you always want players to develop. You know, you want to. You know, when we when a kid from J. Sarah graduates and and Coach Layson's recruiting him for UC Davis. I mean, I I want to be able to prepare him or her right to the to be able to then go to the next level and be have the tools. Uh, up here too uh, to play at that level and so I think we do them a disservice uh, by focusing on the quick hit stuff but look I mean developing an offense first and foremost if you're talking about specific time what do you got if you got a bunch of tiny people that move really quickly then you know what I think you have to have a presence inside the box you have to have people that can post up or whatever if you don't have a true center you need to move and drive and that doesn't mean you clear out the box or in like an umbrella but you Focus a lot of on one-on-one -on -one attacker drills, and one of the hardest things to do in high school is defend in space. Like it's one on the perimeter. One of the hardest things to do on the, from a defensive end is defend someone when you don't have help. I'll force them behind me and drive, but there's no one behind to help. And so, if you can create situations with space and tactically, where your players can, you know shake and bake or whatever analogy you want, but you can just take them off the dribble and force, hey, you're gonna give me ball side or you're gonna take ball side, I'm gonna blast you back door. And you just create drills that go along with that. And then of course there's layers and you gotta talk about pressure passing and you gotta talk about timing of the drives and you gotta talk about 
releasing. And so um, it just depends on what your talent is and, and what you, and that's the other thing too, before I pass this off, is you gotta figure out what your offensive philosophy is. You know, um, some people only wanna play for a center. And that's just, they, it's this, this proper way like this, they just feel you have to have a center and you play for a center. And some people love playing matchup games and just, you know, who, you know there's like two or three, there's like a couple all around players in the pool. And it's just based on matchups, they get in the box, like first guy down, get in the box and you, you kind of play off him or her. I mean, it depends on what your philosophy is as a coach too. And then you gotta work backwards and build out of that. Uh, for me, it's kind of how deep you want to go. How, how well prepared do you want to be? Um, you know, I think people, if they looked at our program, would say you have a lot of after goal plays. I think I have a lot. Um, and I've got quite a few six on five rotations. And there's a reason for that. Um, our different after goal plays end in different scenarios. So we have some that are post up after goal plays. We have some that are designed that if we need a goal right now, we don't have a timeout. So if you have 11 seconds left in the game and you don't have a timeout left, are you prepared? You just got scored on. Are you prepared for something off the line that could give you an opportunity to score? That's your decision if you want to be at that level. Um, and then in terms of six on five plays, you know, Drew and I were discussing this. You got to know your personnel. So I've always felt like our, my team's deficient at six on five. That's one of the areas we struggle. Um, and I feel at six on five, there's a lot of individual de decision making that goes on that higher level players can do a better job with just sort of basic rotations. Um, and if you don't have players that really see the game like a step ahead or that they're, they're thinking on a high level and just read the game so well and, and they can shoot well, then hey, maybe I want to run some type of a rotation that creates a look uh, without getting into a situation where if that look isn't there, we completely fall apart and everybody just goes, no, I don't know what to do, right? So that's the balance. It's a balance. Uh, and that depends mostly on, on, on how deep you want to go and what personnel you have. These guys don't uh, I don't think it's, this question is for me, but maybe my comment <laughs> would be useful for some of you guys. So, I know for two general approaches. How you gonna make the game plans and how you gonna pick uh, the, your game. So one thing is, and one, one approach is that you gonna uh, teach the players what you exactly want. Knowing exactly by the details exactly what you want and how you want to run the game. So this is one approach. So then you doesn't, don't care if someone is talented or less talented, more talented, or this one is, can do this or this. You know what you want and then you're teaching them to that level that they want to achieve, that level that they can be, let's say, useful for that approach for their game plan. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Six on five, five man, game plan, four court offense, style of the game in general. And other approaches which require more flexibility or more awareness of the coach, if you have talented kids, if you're coached with a you know different mindset, then you see what you have, then you are adjusting your game plan in generally depends on the talent what you have, you know, in that group, in that age, in, in that four years in high school. Both of those approaches are leg legitimately right, but requires different approach, different sensibility, and different type of, of uh, working ethics. For example, I prefer the second option, I think the second option is more uh, uh, beauty of the sport and give us more chance to, adva uh, to advance to another level. The first option is also a uh, winning method, you know, but then you are, as I said, you're doing exactly what you want, strictly what you want, and you're teaching them exactly <coughs> You just need to limit it, the working hours in repetition or drills 
teaching them exactly what you want. Both of the approaches are legitimately right. I prefer, as I said, this one, when coaches are capable and more open to invent and to try to you know, invent something new and learn from the players and adjust the game plan depends on the players and the talent of the players or the group they have. Hey, real, real quick, something that Dan said shouldn't go unnoticed. You know, he talked about after goal plays. I'm sure, sure you got maybe some sprint plays. Um, so you, if you're talking in the context of the question was like, you have a 12 week season, what can you do? Maybe you can't train year round. Look as, co as a coach, where can you mac like have your fingerprints all over stuff, right? So like, there's four sprints in a game, right? So if you can win a sprint, let's have people organize off the sprint where you can go down and do something structured, right? That is a little more joysticky, a little more like plan to get a look, right? And that's a way you can control something. Of course, timeout plays are a way you can control something. Um, with a little planning ahead, I know coaches, friends of mine that, that have defensive timeout plays. When, when the opponent calls a timeout, you know, they're gonna do something off and that's special or unique in that counterattack, a little quick ISO play off the counter or something. But you want to look for ways that you can maximize um, possessions, four possessions. And then also, like, when, you know, winning the sprints, you take away a possession from them and you give yourself an extra possession, you know? Can I ask you guys a question? How, how many timeouts do you get in uh, high school water bowl? Two, two, three, four. Depends on the three. tournament. <laughs> two, three. Let's go with three. Let's go with is it three and a 30? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is me personally. It's the same as college, okay? So I have on my game per card prepared for every game, I have one 30 sec second timeout play and I have three six on six, six on five timeout plays. One 30 second timeout play and three six on five. Any of the full six on five timeout plays can be used as a 30. Okay? I also have three six on six timeout plays ready. Okay? And I gotta be honest with you, like I've won games with these plays. I, I know that I understand there's philosophical differences. I'm trying to find the balance between, you know, we, we don't have a set front court on every front court of the game. We, let, we try to let our players play free. We give them the structure that says, hey, we want to play this way and let them play. But when there's a timeout and we have a chance to set something up, we're ready. And I would suggest that you're also ready. So you have a sheet ready, you've gone through these plays with your team, and when the timeout comes and the time is there, you're ready. That's what, that would be my suggestion. Especially if you don't have the most talented group. You can create a look for your team. You're gonna look like Bill Belichick. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I want to say something more. Uh, how many time uh, timeouts you have, guys? You said three or three? Three and one. Three. 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 Okay. But if you are leading the dark team, and you got three and and three full and one thirty seconds. Am I right? So if I'm a coach of dark team, how many timeouts I have? So totally we have six timeouts. So it's not true that you have three timeouts plus one short one. So you got six full timeouts and two short ones. What I'm trying to say, uh, I think that we can upgrade ourselves to a higher level. We can give our players more instruction just if I'm in that moment in defense. You know, to prepare them for the time out to play defense or prepare them for that time out in offense. I can give them more information. I can give them, let's say, say, okay, we're going to do this right now. If we steal the ball, if we defend some, we are doing this. Or we are doing, if we got men up, we are doing this. So, it's wrong approach you get only three timeouts from your side. There's also three timeouts and one short one from the other side. So this is also the timeout. So, brainstorming, one thing. How many of you guys you watch uh, Carl and Kirk Everest, what he's doing sometimes with, uh, when he, they're defending timeout and someone in the offense got fourth court offense against them, six on six. What he was doing a few times. Sending X4, taking off the offense. Thank you. 
I like you. Hey! I like you. <laughs> so it's great. Hey, I was, hey, I was, this, you know, taking advantage. So they are trying to prepare the set from cross offense, set play for six on six. Okay. This is exactly what I'm trying to achieve right now to force you to do brainstorming. So he said, okay. They're going to prepare a set play for six on six. I'm going to send one play around. I decided to play five men. So I didn't stop them. If they decide to pull one and play bad, so their set pieces is fell apart. So because they have five on five. You can do, this is the beauty of the sport. And I'm encouraging everyone, please see last possession. Try to find on YouTube somewhere last possession of Italian against Serbia against Italy in Budapest, last possession in second quarter for Italian's national team. And please see that moment. Thank you. You have some homework now. You have some homework to do. Um, I got two, there's two more questions, so we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, uh, and this, may, may, many of you may find this relevant, because some people wrote, and I don't know how many of you guys want to help answer this. I can help answer this, uh, because I had to deal with this myself. Uh, but uh, many people asked, uh, how do you work or train when you have a shallow end in your pool, right? When you have a shallow, deep, shallow, deep pool. How many people work with a shallow, deep pool here? Okay, okay. Um, uh, he, uh, <laughs> I can give you some, some tips of, uh, and some things that I had to do when coaching in, in a shallow deep pool. If anybody else wants to answer this, you can uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, so some, some of you may be spoiled and not have had to deal with this situation before, but uh, <laughs> lucky, lucky you. Um, but uh, I would say it, it's time to get creative. So I'll, I'll piece two things together if we're talking shallow deep pools, so, since we have so many of them, right? So, so two things. And, uh, uh, both, everybody here, I'll just say all three in their talks mentioned uh, working in stations, right? And like station work and how do you get to stations. Station work in a shallow deep pool becomes crucial. It's literally one of the only ways you can train in that pool effectively, right? It, it, to, to make it work, you got to use station work. So I'll get to that in a second. But one thing, uh, again, I picked up from, and I coached, the, you guys know this, I'll talk more about this tomorrow. I coached in the CWPA conference right, for, for a long time which means we also had to play against shallow deep teams, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to, co had to coach against, coach games at Johns Hopkins and George Washington and uh, Iona. I, Iona a lot. There's a lot of shallow deep pools. So the, the list is too long to, to reference. So I also had to think of strategy. So another thing, this goes back to the first thing I said in my first presentation, in my first presentation is talk to other coaches who also have shallow deep pools, right? And you can brainstorm together and think about ways you can. So some of the things I'm talking about, I took from someone else, Hartwick. I forgot Hartwick. When they started programs, it was also shallow deep, right? Uh, and we were there. So one thing I learned from uh, Hartwick, I went training, I did like a four-day training camp with our women there for once, is if, that, if this is the shallow side of the pool, right? Is this, uh, can anybody see? We have a shallow deep pool. Here, I'm going to move it up. It's also the marker. It's more of the marker. Okay. It's really not that complicated, so it's okay. You know? Uh, well, it's more... Uh, this is more for my sake, but uh, let's just assume this second half of the board here is shallow, right? This is the shallow end of the pool. Oh <laughs> this is the shallow end. <laughs> you can imagine. There's like 12 markers, 12 markers here. None of them work. This is 14. Okay. I could probably explain this without a visual, but uh, okay. it'll, it'll, it's, <laughs> everyone's hungry is dinner time, right? So it's shallow in, right? Shallow in here. Wait. All right. You want to give me a try? Let me see. All right. You get a, you get a prize if this works. You get a you get a, you get a, you get a consolation prize here. Huh? No. Oh. Waiting for you outside. Right? I got a coaching book waiting for you outside. More, more homework. More homework. It's not going to be real happy that it's a sharp one. Yeah. Uh, so, again, this is the pool. Right? So, let's come closer. Away from the glare. Okay? If this is the shallow end, if this is the shallow end right, of, of the pool, you're generally going to run most of your front court plays, offensive drills, half the stuff that like Coach Layson was talking about, where his team's going back and forth to half and back, right? So, or excuse me, to full court. 
But the way to do it with a shallow end is to go half and back. So any time you have a shallow end uh, pool, and you're, so you're training in there, you keep all your front court work in the deep end. Everything in the deep end. So do all your front court work for offense, defense in the deep end. You don't want to keep them vertical or stagnant for too long, right? Then you have them counter out, right? And you give them a 10 second possession in the shallow end, right? You have 10 seconds to attack finish, and we counter right back, and then we stay in the front court. So from tactically, now you're spending, let's say 80% of your front court O and D work in deep water and 20% in shallow water, right? And then now you've at least mitigated how often you're using the shallow for that. Now you're gonna tell me, well, I need to practice my shallow and offensive plays. And I wanna go back to you and say, no, you don't, right? Just <laughs> shoot the ball, get it on cage, make sure your center jumps off the bottom and dunks it and go the other way, right? Um, it's how, how it works, right? So you don't, just don't spend too much time on that. And I, it's not, it's, it sounded like a joke, but it's not even Coach Lacey said, flood the pool. We've been in situations, I also coached at UC Santa Barbara for a long time. And UC Santa Barbara has a shallow end, you know, uh, in, their, uh, in their, so this is a college D1, right, program where we had to deal with that. We would flood the pool on home games as best as we could, right, so to deal with that. But we never, ever, in four years at UCSB when I was there, learned or taught how to run a shallow end offense, right? It's not, just not a waste, it's a waste of time. So this is one tactic, right? Stay here as much as you can when you're doing tactical stuff. Now when you're doing technical stuff and we're talking station work, since we ruined the board already, we'll fundraise for a new one, Tim, all right? Um, if we're gonna go station work and you have a shallow end on one side, uh, Coach Lacey put up a great structure right, for how to structure your pool in 25 yards, right? So now you're in a 25 yard, shallow deep, six lane pool, right? And we talked about swimming not being important, right, with, with, with lane lines and goggles, okay? So well, what can you do in a shallow end, right, that doesn't have you standing on the bottom in the shallow end? Swim. Swimming head up, swimming head up with the ball, swimming, swimming head up in, in, and being mobile, going over your hips, back and forth. So all station number one in the shallow end is all my, let's call it swimming for water polo, right? Swimming for water polo. Head up with the ball. Have them do wall drills. We have drills, these, the, the wall drills uh, is another drill we have on our app, right? Where if Coach Lacey's the wall, my hips are out, coming off the wall to shot block, and now I'm back. This can all be done in a shallow end, right? So if I have 25 players and I got five stations, five are here doing this. I can go five in the middle, this is just an example. I'm, I'm literally saying this off the top of my head. That's why it's creative for you guys to do whatever you need to do. Station, none of the five guys are doing, or five women are doing legs over here with the heavy ball, right? Doing the heavy ball drill. Station three, now we can do our normal shooting, right? Because we're here in the, in the deep end, right? And we can do it right, okay? Station four, now I can pass on this side, right? So I got my shooting, I got my passing, I got my legs, right? I've got, I've got my swimming, head up, and I can even add, if I have, this is for 20 athletes, if I have five, I can go five. Coach Lacey said this too, it wasn't a joke. If you have two, if you have 73 in your training, then this should be a dry land station, All right? So now you're, I only have six lanes, and it's shallow deep, then I get five kids out of the pool, that pool just got a lot bigger, right? Because five kids take a lot of space in the six lane pool. So what am I doing on dry land, All right? I'm working on my shoulders, I'm working on my form, I'm getting against the wall, I'm tapping the ball 100 times against the wall, strengthening my shoulders, Low, high, backhand, I can be on my knees if they're really young kids, like 10s and 12s, right? Can be on the wall, passing back and forth on the wall. We could be doing stretch bands with the cords. Again, there's a hundred million things you could do, right? It's your chance to be creative. So now I've got 25 kids and I have no clue here that the pool is shallow. At no point am I affected by the shallow pool and this is effective training. And each station is eight to 10 minutes on a two minute rotation. I just got a 60 to 70 minute workout in, right? And I don't have to worry about shallow pool, fair enough? Yeah. We, we set up two cages and half tank also and have to shoot down the side. Like put your cages all deep over here. Yeah. So you can go cage, 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 shoot, shoot. Three cages deep end and nothing under there and just swim on the side and then you can have sharp shooting on one side and you can have... Sure. My point is, is it's a, that's great. That's another structure. Way to keep everything in the deep end. You should never, the shallow end is not a, a barrier, right? It should not be a barrier to you being able to have effective training. The only question, the only drawback is being able to play full court deep water polo, 
And everything you've learned in the last six hours, it's that's the least important skill, right, that they need to know to be successful water polo teams and players, right, in the long run. So you just, de we devalued, right, the ability to, to play tactically that much. And again, the first thing I showed, and, and still be able to attack quickly, you can still take advantage of it. So just something to, to think about. Questions or anything else to add on the shallow end? Or you want to clarify? Helpful? Right. Station work. Station work, shallow end work. You can build great teams there. Anything you guys want to add? You can use the stagger start, so if you don't want to spend a lot of time in the shallow end, you can stagger and counter into the other end and stay there for 10 front courts. So you get at least some up and down work. Also, the, how shallow are we talking? Four and a half. Three, four feet. So horizontal pushing egg beater drills. Anything where you're in the horizontal position, if it's deep enough, it could be center and center defender work where the center's working on getting around. Technique work with the center. Anything where the bodies are like this, something that can be done there. I got one question. Why we cannot put those ideas when you guys try to do on your shower pools some uh, clips on uh, on YouTube that everybody can share? Mm. So you can organize like a Chicago shower pool water pool. <laughs> so, no, I'm not making fun. I just I just think that we should be you know unique. We instead trying to be unique. Yeah. It doesn't matter which kind of which uh, kind of uh, you know professional. You know. So I think that uh, as I said, uh, we sh we said in the beginning, let's share the knowledge. This is a shared information. So I don't think that they're gonna benefit or put someone else in the you know in worse situation or less. You know, I think all is uh, can be benefit for the community. If, uh, if one of you will allow us, I'll, I'll film two versions of that workout in a shallow end and put it, put it on YouTube. If one of you guys allow it in your, in your pool, if you let me do it, we'll come, we'll run, it, we'll run your kids through the thing, we'll videotape it and throw it up on our coach education. Why not? I mean, I can talk about it all day on the whiteboard, but the coach is 100% right. It would look a lot cooler if we videotaped it. Um, Last qu last question. So, somebody asked, and it's, it's a good way to end because. Uh, There's a question. Is it oh no no no! I was just saying, come to my pool and do that at all. All right. <laughs> yeah. all, you, all you gotta do is buy me dinner. Um, uh, <laughs> anytime. Uh, uh, Coach Dosic uh, is gonna get back to training with the with the men's team tomorrow, right? So I gotta get up, we gotta get on a plane uh, plane tomorrow. So but somebody asked a, a question. This will be the last question of the night before we go. Uh, uh, about what your favorite coaching moment was in your career, right? So your uh, a career that, or some moment in your career that really meant something to you. So you can think about that for a second, two minutes or less. Right? It's dinner time. <laughs> um, and uh, and then tomorrow we'll get back. After that, I'd love to take a quick group picture too while we have coach with us, and then we'll come back again. Doors will open at eight thirty, but then at, uh, but we'll start presentations uh, sharply at nine, so we don't run out of time. Yeah, you can. Let's say uh, we'll take that offline because I think the new rules only affect a few people, you know, and it hasn't affected you guys yet. We we'll take it afterwards and then give them your moment. You know? I think uh, we are prepared for this. You know, I think that we already did some drills on the practice and we are mentally ready for this. Uh, I like those new rules. You know, I was working for them for a long time ago. I think that there is a lot of uh, new new rules should be add in the future to make uh, more uh, familiar to everyone our sport to be easy to understand and more more watchable. So I like this, you know. So we're trying to, you know, we are prepared. I think that this group is well prepared. We are doing, uh, we are using the shop clock all the time. We already prepared, as uh, Danny said, uh, some set plays. Doesn't matter 10 seconds, 20 seconds after the uh, corner possessions. So those, this, you know. The most, uh, uh, the problem is, uh, unfortunately, that the calls are not the same. You know, the calls are not the same. Even if supposed to be really clear what is the call, what is not the call. So it's, it's still a adjusting time. So I think uh, this is the process, you know. But I like, personally, I like the new rules. And I think that if, uh, 
if Fina or uh, Juana uh, follow the instructions and go in the re in direction to clear the game, I vote for the dead favorite. You know? So, but I would like to see all calls to be called in the same way. So, I think it's good. Favorite coaching moment. Favorite coaching moment. Uh, so I learned from my uh, tutors from uh, from my beginning. Uh, the best, always the best coaching moment should be supposed to be last coaching moment. So right now it's Panam Panam Games. We won Panam Games. So I'm I'll remember what what we did in the past and the the good moments from the past. I, but I think that the last moment. You know, and the last competition always when you make success is keeping you more motivated and go forward. So I'm voting right now for Panels and the Lima. Tomorrow. 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 Yeah. Tomorrow I'll tell you my favorite coaching moment. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, if you guys don't mind, let's come down real quick and we'll take a quick picture just right here. We can maybe do a the day of social media and take a big selfie. Although you guys standing behind us.